Okay, so hi everybody. My name is Kendra Moyer and um, I am presenting today on basically assuring the integrity of data source sites. Um, how do we assure that our references are what they claim to be? And what are the standards in the industry? Um, most specifically, I'm, I'm using academic research um, and library research for deciding if a web-based web source is a reliable source. And um, what we have come up with is, or what the Library Association, the American Library Association has created is called the CRAAP, or, and CRAAP, C-R-A-A-P. There is actually a test, and I'm gonna go through some of the major points on it and kind of explain how, um, how we evaluate, for example, any of the crazy stories we've been hearing from both ends of our spectrums that, that, that should be verified. So the first um, letter is going to be C, which is for currency, which is the timeliness of the information. And we're going to try to understand when was the information published or posted to our understanding of, you know, how things are going at the present moment. So when the, when the article was published is going to have more bearing on current events. So that's very important. Um, also relevant to currency is, has the information been revised or updated since initially pub published? Sometimes there are errors in a article. Sometimes facts change, or not, the, I guess facts never change, but sometimes fact, fact finders will find things out that weren't initially added to uh, a first edition of an article. So we want to make sure that we have every revision and every update and every new version of that. And the next, the next point we want to make sure about is, is the information current or out of date for you? Um, any, any, um, I, I, while I was researching this, I, I found some, some kind of crazy fake news of, of, of yesterday. And it was kind of interesting that at a point, uh, the, the story became outdated. It was no longer published because it did not stand up to scientific, to scientific um, knowledge that came out. So, and then the last thing we want to look at uh, with currency is how current are the links? Are they functional? Are they all updated? When you go onto the website, do the links take you places that are still active and functioning? So that would be C. And for each of these, you can give, um, you know, the worksheet I've been provided with um, offers ratings of one to 10 for um, excellent. So each of these letters C, you would go through and you could do a point by point, giving each of those areas one through 10 on whether or not that article was current. It might be extremely current and get a 10, but it might, you know, some articles, they have relevant information, but they, they may date back to the 80s or 90s and therefore they, they wouldn't rate as high for currency. So moving on to our, our is relevance. And for our, we're talking about the importance of the information for your needs and purposes. So when you um, are researching an article or using a, a source for a new writing or to present something as I'm doing right now, you wanna make sure that information you extract from these sources is relevant and important for your purposes. So some questions you may wanna ask yourself include, does this information relate to your topic or answer your question? Next is who is the intended audience? Are we targeting children, senior citizens, readers, people who are active? You wanna make sure you, you are targeting your information or that the relevance relates to the proper population. Um, is the information at an appropriate level? And by that we would mean, is it is it accessible for people of many different educational levels. And, and I think our standard is around eighth grade level, but so you want you want the information to be something that most people are able to read and comprehend. Have you looked at us before choosing this one? And when we, we're thinking about a variety of sources that, that includes personal interviews, that includes books, papers, journals, um, documentaries, films. Uh, we can look at 
places like historical museums and uh, art museums, all the all places where we can document um, moments in time. So they, they would qualify as um, basically relevant. Um, so that those that would go speak to the variety. Um, next, would you you would you be you comfortable using this first in a research paper? Again, going back to variety of sources, can you trace um, as much of this this information back to its original source, either the person who said it, either a, an extremely reliable source in a journal or library? you know, books and so forth, things that have been published, things that are relied upon in industry. So those are things that, that are, are standard. And, and since we know that everything can be manipulated, you know, you want to, again, pull, pull in as many of a variety of sources that substantiate what, you, what you're attempting to communicate. So moving on to the first A, A would be authority. And authority is something that was recently updated by the American Library Association. Um, because again, how do we determine who is an authority on a subject and, and what qualifies that person? There, there are many different, uh, a, a sociologist may be a, a, an expert on homelessness, but a person who's homeless is also an expert on homelessness. So we want to have some questions you want to ask yourself is who is the author, publisher, source, or sponsor of the information? Um, so again, that's your books, your journals, who wrote this, who put it together, and then you're going to at some point be questioning their, their research, research sources. Next, we'd ask, are the author's credentials or organizational affiliations given. Again, um, throughout space and time, you know, we have all kinds of institutions and within the educational system, obviously, we have a range of institutions, some that are more credible than others. So again, you want to look at people's credentials and look at, you know, whether or not those credentials are stand throughout space and time as being being you know relevant as well as reliable and and by that I mean truthful and honest and this is a one of those academic you know that's a that's a, a, a something that's going to be very forever but moving on again on authority what are the authors or we said that already but what are the author's qualifications to write on the topic so again they're gonna they're gonna look at the author's the author's breadth of work, the author's training, the author's actual field work and experience, actual research in the field. Again, depending on the topic, if you're writing on birds or an ornithology, then you should be someone who's gone into the field, obviously. Does that necessarily mean in it? Again, <laughs> you can be an expert writing a book, but you can also be an expert in the field, and sometimes the two merge. Next is their contact information, such as a publisher email address. Um, this is very critical for verifying authority because if you're looking at something on the web, it, it is important that you can get back in touch with the person who wrote it to verify that they wrote it, to verify that they exist, and so forth. So you want to make sure there's some kind of contact information. So if the source ever need, is questioned, you can get back to the original author. And um, I'll reveal anything about the author or source. So again, I think that again would speak to the, the author's level of skill, the author's training, the author's uh, affiliation with and so forth. So all of these things come into play when we're establishing whether someone's an authority on a topic. So we're going to move on next to the second A, which is accuracy, which uh, speaks to the reliability the truthfulness and the correctness of the content. So we want to ask first, where does the information come from? And um, as research information can come again from a variety of sources, it can come from novels, books, history, newspaper journals, uh, human human sources from the arts. Um, there's so many different different ways that we can receive information depending on what we're researching. Is the information supported by evidence? And uh, a good good question to ask 
a, a, an easy question to ask is how do we know that this is true? How do we know? And that would that would be the evidence. You, you'd have something tangible. You'd have something you can show someone. And, and that's where we get into uh, kind of libel and, and, and spec, speculative um, outlooks on, on how something may or may not have happened. But again, um, is there evidence to support it? Um, receipts, so to speak. Um, has the information been reviewed or refereed? Um, often, often research is peer reviewed by others in the industry who have training in research and who are able to spot when um, research is inconsistent or when it does not um, follow a, a, an established timeline, uh, when it does not seem to fit. Um, and, it, and a story comes to mind where someone just uh, completely debunked. Actually, it was Carl, Carl Castaneda. Carlos Castaneda's books were completed by a very, very, who just meticulously went back over all of the writings and found that there are these inconsistencies he had not really gone down to, you know, Oaxaca and met this Don Juan in a parking lot. There, the person didn't exist. There, there were people who mirror, mirror those, you know, attributes, but there was no real person that could be found when speaking to the locals. And so, but the books are still sold and his story is still accepted by, as truth by many. So that, that, that would be an example, but it took a very skilled researcher after after Castaneda's death to go back and say, wait a minute, this does not fall in line with what we know traditionally of this, of this, uh, these Na Native American cultures. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink of water one sec. Okay, and, so and just as a time check, Kendra, we've got about five if uh, you, we could uh, We've got about five minutes left. Sure, and I'm I'm actually about 80, 90 percent done oh, here, perfect, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna through the rest. Um, so, can you verify the information in another source? I kind of just went over that, so that's self-explanatory. Does the language or tone seem biased and free of emotion? That's very important in our times today because that's that becomes an issue and and. A lot of our propaganda is, is an emotion often to get get messages across that may not be factual. Are there spelling, grammar, or other typographical errors? Again, this would speak to the professionalism, to whether or not this uh, research has been reviewed. And again, th this is where, depending on the author's level of skill and respectability and, and reliability in the industry where we may find whether or not they're they're being they're vetted if they're considered to be an actual authority or if their work is considered accurate and um finally we're we're over to p which is the per the reason the information exists of the information why is this um research being conducted what what it, what do we expect to be the uh final goal of this research the authors and sponsors make their intentions or purpose clear. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Again, we want to make sure there is a reason for this research and we're looking for a, a, an application for it, what, what the outcome of that would be. Does a point of view appear to be objective and impartial? So are we looking at these stories are we looking at um, topic stories, approaching research um, with new eyes as though it's something that we, we don't bring all of our baggage to? So that's something we real, really want to look at is, is part of paying attention to the tone is listening for bias. And we're, we're at the very end here because this is the last of it. Are there ideological, cultural, institutional, or personal biases? And I mean, I think, think that's the probably part of the question of our times is can we objectively record what is going on historically at this moment? That's a very critical moment because we're kind of watching these shifts in um, ideology and we're watching people rationalize um, the changes without fully, fully going through the process of fact finding. 
So we want to make sure that tools to go through and um, learn to question, question what is put before them and understand that they do have, you know, agency and going back and, and checking for themselves that, that this is true. So that's pretty much my presentation. And um, thanks everyone for having me today. You know, I think that we all need more Martin Luther King Juniors. What do you think? I <laughs> Definitely. And I think that's our biggest problem. We need more Martin Luther King Juniors in our world right now. Um, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said, in our glorious fight for civil rights, we must guard against being fooled by false slogans. He was talking about the right to work laws. And you think about right to work, you think, wow, everyone wants to have the right to work, right? I want the right to work. I want to be able to make money. I want to be able to buy stuff. It sounds good, but it was a false slogan. Um, He said it robbed us of our civil rights. Its purpose is, quote, its purpose is to destroy labor unions and the freedom of collective bar bargaining. Our freedom of collective bargaining by which unions have improved work, uh, wages and working conditions of everyone. We demand this fraud to be stopped. So the most important thing that I think we really need to think about are what are the false slogans that we have today? We don't have our wonderful Martin Luther King Jr. now telling us, hey, that's a false slogan. We need to see it for ourselves. So I think that um, the right to work was, well, it sounded good, but it was obviously mislabeled. It should have been called undermine unions. And then people wouldn't have supported it, right? Um, so right now I'm going to talk about false slogans that are foisted upon us right now by corporate media. And one of them is called, uh, I keep looking to see if it's all done. <laughs> um, one of it's called money doesn't equal speech. And the other one is called corporations aren't people. And they all go under the guise of, that, that's it, it's the blue one with the little right. cartoons. This one? Nope, this that one. one. Now, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, so if you want, you can come closer because of the light. Correction. It's destroying our way of life. Make business control. Right. It might be too dark, so if you want to get closer, you can. So the, the video that I'm going to show you is right now, I wanted to do two, one about corporations aren't people and one about money doesn't equal speech. This one here is only about money doesn't equal speech. What does money doesn't equal speech mean? And, and I mean, if you think about it, you know, well, I'll talk about that, but corporations aren't people. I, since I didn't make the video, I was going to talk to you about what does corporations aren't people really mean? What is the, you know, what does this slogan mean to us? Well, we, it sounds good, right? Because corporations are taking over our government. Mega corporations are taking over our government. And that's bad. And we, don't, we want it to stop. But corporations aren't people is a false slogan. It means something different than take big business out of our politics. It means actually kind of just the opposite. Um, and I, I would like you guys, if you could, to try and figure out like um, the right to work laws I think that it shouldn't have been called right to work. I think it should have been called undermine unions. I think it'd be great if you guys could help me and figure out what is the real slogan that should be it called. You guys figure it out for yourself. You say, oh, okay, these are the things that it does. What should it really be called? Okay, does this work? Good. Um, I did like three years of research on this and I did read, I actually kind of like him though. <laughs> we could just watch him, it's okay. <laughs> Um, okay, Lee. Um, yeah, I, I actually did, I read the amendments for the Udall Amendment that um, the, <clears throat> the Senate voted on. Um, 
I've read Bernie's uh, amendment to um, to reverse Citizens United. I have, I mean, I contacted the uh, um, FEC. I talked to them. I read through all of the regulations. I researched on corporate. Um, all right. So I've done a lot of research on this to try and figure out what was going on. And actually, I know it's really hard to see that, so if you want to watch it again, my friend said that when he watched it the second and third time, he said it really came across and he really understood it better. It's kind of, a, it's like when you are th seeing things in one way, it's kind of hard to see it in a different way. Um, so um, that one is about uh, our, our, our speech rights. So. Um, Money doesn't equal speech. It does not mean that money will not be speaking because corporate media is going to be the only one speaking. That's what Congress will allow. The thing that's really interesting um, is that if big business controls Congress, which it does, and we give it the power to silence people or organizations, it's not going to silence. It's not going to silence the ones who are controlling it. It's going to silence us. It's going to silence you. It's going to silence me. It's going to silence our organizations that actually uh, represent us. They'll decide. This guy, big business will big business will decide, not 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 us. And so speech rights um, are, are are. It's dangerous to. Um, to give the speech rights, to take away our speech rights so that Congress can decide. Now, I didn't talk about uh, corporations aren't people. Are you guys interested in that? Do you want to hear about corporations aren't people? Good. All right. Thanks. <clears throat> corporations. All right. What if I said that all people are evil and they all should have no rights? Would that be a good thing? Now, what if, um, now when we look at corporations, do we really know what they are? Did you guys know that the ACLU is a corporation? That the NAACP is a corporation? And I bet the Pirate Party is a corporation. Is it? Okay, but you know what it is? It's a legal fiction. Yes. Now, so, so <laughs> when they say corporations are people, they're attacking all legal fictions. And that includes unions. A lot of unions are actually corporations and some of them, but they're all legal fictions and the pirate party is a legal fiction. Um, now, if we want to say corporations aren't people, what it kind of says, I mean, I, I'm trying to understand, the way it's sold to us is that corporations are bad and what we need to do is take away their power. But we're really not saying, just like with people and we go, oh, all people are bad, they should all have no rights, right? What we're really, we're not attacking the pirate party when we say corporations aren't people. We don't think we are. We don't think we're attacking our town. Did you guys know that, well, my town it was incorporated in, I don't know, 1729 or something like that. I mean, our towns are corporations. All of these entities of collections of people are, are legal fictions. So wh when uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said that the right to work laws, the purpose was to destroy labor unions and the freedom of collective bargaining. They're actually talking about, they're talking about people getting together, the power of the people. So I would, two minutes. Oh. So I'd like to know, do you guys have any idea? I know the, it was really hard to see the video and I know I didn't get to talk that long, but there are two false slogans here. One is, Corporations aren't people, and the other one is money doesn't equal speech. Does anyone have any ideas of a better slogan for that? Yes. Yes. It's perfect. I love it. Yeah. The media lies. I love it. Actually, I said, with corporations aren't people, the lie is that corporations are only big business. That's not true. Corporations are also nonprofit, ch churches, activist groups. CR Club is a corporation. The Red Cross is a corporation. I, I, there are lots of, I mean, all legal, legal fictions. 
So what Corporations Armed People does is it takes the rights and the protections of legal fictions. And you know who doesn't have to worry about it at all? These jackasses, okay? They don't care, they write the laws. Do they have to be protected from themselves? That's ridiculous. Oh yes, please. Um, well, if you write a law, okay, so this was really interesting when I was doing the research. There's this uh, law called the Disclose Act. It actually never was passed, but what's interesting about the Disclose Act is that Congress, when they wrote it, they said the NRA is exempt. Now, I don't have any problems with the NRA. I mean, I'm not a big gun fanatic or anything like that, but if you think about it, if they can write in a law that the NRA is exempt, that means they can say, Oh, who, look at this, these guys are exempt. Do you know what I mean? So how can they? Because they can write the laws. The lobbyists write our laws. Most of them are written by lobbyists. And it's the real problem here with corruption is really the revolving door, in my opinion. But I'm not touching on that right now because I only have probably two seconds left, right? Um, so wait, let me just finish one thing. What is the other lie? Reversing Citizen United will end corruption. Well. Actually, what it does is, like you saw, the McCain-Feingold Act, that's what Citizen United was about. It was about somebody taking out an ad and the FEC saying, no, you can't do that. So what is the truth? Because reversing Citizen United will not stop corruption. It will not stop the revolving door. It will not stop the power of, of, of big business. What it does is it, it says only the media will influence voters and, enough, and, and will do nothing to stop the revolving door. So no, it won't stop corruption. It takes away our rights. And you know what? Because of the internet, because we're now communicating, they're trying to shut us down. They're trying to say, you know what? We used to have every control over every, all the, the, the narratives, all the thoughts. We had control over everybody. But now people are talking, people are thinking. People are, make, are actually doing the research on themselves. I didn't get paid for this. But you know what? I want us to be free and I want us to 